Welcome to the Phil Fisher Podcast. Thoughtful Christian conversation from a slightly warped perspective. And now, your host, Phil Fisher. Hey there, welcome back to the show. This is the Phil Fisher Podcast. I'm Phil Fisher. I'm here with Christian Taylor. Hey, Phil. Hi, Christian. It's kind of... This purple, I like it. It's a very light lavender. It is. Very and, well, light the, lavender. and then there's the darker. And darker lavender. You're layered lavender today. I am. Oh, I fantastic. like that. That's fantastic. Yeah. And Sky Jatani. Hi, Phil. Oh, you're wearing black. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's great. Mm-hmm. I'm wearing charcoal gray. Do you oh. wear black all the time or just on the podcast? No, I don't wear black all the time, but I have other shirts that don't film well. Oh. Yeah. So. Yeah. I got mad at him last week because he wore a pattern. Yeah. <laughs> he wore checkers. Oh. Checkers. Our guest knows you don't wear checkers on camera. That's insane. <laughs> okay, we'll get we to We have a guest? We have a guest. We'll get to that soon enough. I got to sing, sing the theme song. Wait, you have to. Oh, did you say hi to him? Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Can I start? Go ahead. <laughs> Hey, it's a podcast. What do you know? Hey, it's a podcast. And we got video. Hey, it's a podcast. It's a London here. The Phil Fisher Podcast starts right here. Oh, we'll talk to Sky. Hi. And Christian, too. I think he's bored with this bit. We've got a guest right here for you. But we aren't telling you who he is yet. Hey, it's a podcast. It's a London here. The Phil Fisher Podcast starts right here. The Phil Fisher Podcast starts right here. I'm still not doing more veggie voices because I thought we talked about this on the 200th podcast that that I thought that shtick got a little old because the ukulele hasn't. No, <laughs> ukulele, ukulele is timeless. I love it when uh-huh. you're so quick. timeless. Um, our guest is Nathan Clark. Hi, Nathan. Hey, how you guys doing? Good. You probably recognize Nathan. He's the spokesman for, um, let's see, what product can we give you? He's, he's the spokesman for Ford dealers in the greater Cincinnati region. He's the, uh, if you could be the spokesman for anything, what would it be? I mean, Ford dealer, uh, Skyline Chili with every Ford. Ooh, that's, <laughs> that's good stuff right there. Uh, Nathan Clark is a filmmaker. He's actually the filmmaker that made the um, Bono meets Eugene Peterson film that we were talking about a couple of weeks ago, who's also a friend of Sky's, so we thought we would have him on the show to talk about that. But first, this podcast, this is our, this is our, we, now we have a commercial break. We yes. need to have a commercial break on every episode. This podcast was brought to you by you. Yes, you, viewers like you, and listeners like you, are supporting this podcast through Patreon. Our Patreon campaign is up at Patreon slash, patreon.com slash Phil Vischer, I think is what it is. So, yes, yes, Jason's nodding vigorously that I got that right, and he'll put it up on screen. Uh, go to patreon.com backslash, forward slash, <laughs> forward slash Phil Vischer, and you can support the podcast because we need to pay Jason so he can put up the Patreon logo. <laughs> See, it's circular. It's kind of meta. Um, and How's also it going? edit the show. We're off to an okay start. We need I, more. Okay. I don't know how you gauge the... the the start? Yeah, because I'm sure compared to some campaigns, we're doing great. Yeah, and others and, horrible. Uh, yeah. It yeah, so we're doing what we're doing as, okay. a, as opposed to what I think other we're, people might we're be about doing. 25%. Yeah, of the first goal. Of the first goal. Yeah, we yeah. are. About a quarter of the okay. first goal. What if we, what if we like, uh, scare people? Like we're political campaigns. Or like, like televangelists. Televangelists or political campaigns that try to frighten people into supporting them? I d- I don't, I'm not in favor of that. I do not think that bodes well. Support us or else. What's the or else? I well, don't even know what the or else is. The Atheist Podcast will take over. Oh, you're right. The Atheist <laughs> right? Podcast. Who's the boogeyman? Cameras. We need a boogeyman. We need a boogeyman. Yeah. The Atheist Podcasts will steal our cameras and use them for Satan's they'll purposes. They'll steal Jason. And they'll force your That's children really matters. to be on their podcast. And, and with satanic coloring books. You know, everyone will have to worship bath mats. You don't want... <laughs> <laughs> That's a reference from an older. Go look it up. Yeah. Baphomet is the word exactly. Fascinating f- story from our good friend Lucian Greaves, who we need to have on the podcast sometime. Because mm-hmm. if I can be friends, we can be friends with anybody. You yeah, found right? that out. How do you be friends with fictional characters, though? No, he just is. It's like being friends with Batman. He's he's well, he is a fictional character. But I mean, if there was a superhero, if Batman was real, oh, you could going. be friends with Batman, even though it's an alter ego 
of Bruce Wayne. So fund our Patreon campaign so you can pay for Phil's mental health care because he's <laughs> clearly not in his right Among mind. Among other things. In the last week, I also relaunched philvisher.com. Yes, that's right. If you've ever been to philvisher.com over the last two years, you realize it is a wasteland of nothing but the feeds to this podcast because I wasn't doing anything else. And I'm getting motivated. I've been learning things from... I've been listening to Michael Hyatt and other motivational speakers that tell you how to do all of your own media. And I'm so inspired that I'm doing more of my own media instead of waiting for other people to do it for me or paying them to. So go to philvisher.com because I just relaunched it. It's got the podcast on it. It's got other stuff that I've written and I'm going to be writing new stuff. And if you go there... You can sign up for my newsletter, which I just did. You are really catching up, Phil. I know. I'm trying. I'm very proud of I'm you. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. Mm-hmm. I have a podcast. You're becoming an entrepreneur. Be careful. Watch out. Well, I've always been an entrepreneur yeah. of some level. But now he's doing but this it on is social a media. Kind of entrepreneurship. That, this is the 2000. That is somewhat foreign to me. You know. And you can go to philvisher.com and watch my little rant about Donald Trump and Doritos, which is going over quite well. People seem to like it. Told you. It's how Doritos gave us Donald Trump. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I liked it. So go to go to philvisher.com and you can check it out. All right. Okay. Uh, one news story, uh, just keeping up with our friends in Kentucky, Ken Ham's building his Ark Park. Right. Ar- that sounds good. Ark Park. Yeah, I know. It's awesome. It's Ark Park. The Ark Park. It sounds like aardvark. It's like aardvark, but it's an ark park. Is it just a big ark that you yeah. can go in and see animals, like a no, petting zoo? No, no, no. I don't think they have real animals because then the ark would stink mm. on the inside. Because that's one thing you don't think about is how badly the ark smells. I think about it all the time. Like, what did they do with all that extra it's because you have three it? boys. It is because I have boys. And I think, oh my goodness, they spent all that time shoveling that poop. Yeah, right. That's what, that was Ham's job. Have you ever gone to the primate house at the zoo? It's like that. Yeah. It doesn't smell good. It does not smell good. It doesn't smell good. And that's just the apes. Did, have, did you Imagine ever go into my laundry room when we had three ferrets? <laughs> oh. Why did you yeah. have ferrets? I had ferrets too. It's it bad. It did not smell good. Uh-uh. Why? Uh, my wife is a sucker for furred things. She could have gotten a coat. <laughs> <laughs> Coats don't crawl up in your lap. You have to make them move yourself. Mm. And so, you know, you go to Petco and they don't have dogs and cats at Petco. They have ferrets. So you're looking like fish. That's dumb. Fish aren't, aren't furry and cuddly. And they have little rats and things. And we tried those. But it's just not enough. You just, it's just not enough. It's, they're like the chicken McNuggets of pets. They're, too, they're like just bite size. And you want, you want a whole meal of a They pet. may actually be what chicken nuggets are made <laughs> from. <laughs> and so then, then you find this cage of ferrets. Mm. And they say, would you like to hold a ferret? And your children squeal with glee. Whee! Like would you piggies. like to hold a ferret? <laughs> <laughs> and so you get to hold a ferret, and you think these little creatures are delightful. Mm. I'm not sure why the Petcos don't all stink from the ferrets. They must bathe they them. They change them every they day. They bathe them like hourly. Yeah, and they ventilate. Yeah. Ferrets are stinky. So yeah. you take them home, and within 24 hours, whatever room they're in is, is a stinky room. Mm. But then you got two. I don't know. Oh, you got two because one seemed like it would get lonely. So yeah. you got two. But then you have two, but you have three kids. It's like, I don't have a ferret. Which ferret's my ferret? And so you get a third ferret, and now you have, you're loaded with ferret. And <laughs> then they get, like, like, get, they get themselves stuck places. Like they crawl actually inside your couch. They go down through the cushions. Mm-hmm. They're kind of a burrowing creature. They, they burrow into your couch and get stuck inside your couch, and you have to like open up your couch from underneath it to get the ferret out. And then they go inside your washing machine, not just in the, the drum, but behind and under the drum mm-hmm. into the electronics of your washing machine and then they get stuck and you have to figure out how to fish a live ferret out of the guts of your washing machine and you're saying honey this was a terrible terrible <laughs> idea and then your kids have stopped playing with them they're like they've, gremlins they've gotten bitten a few times and because they're too stinky and then you've got three ferrets so you don't know what to do with or like in my house they slipped outside the door and they're lost forever so well, <laughs> that <speaking> was terrible <laughs> is that i heard about that 10 foot ferret in the forest <laughs> that that was mine, found. I'm sure. So, Phil, what happened to your three ferrets? We returned them to Petco. Oh, do, you did? Do they yeah. take returns? Yeah, they do. 
we had to the option, give ours the, away. the alternative is you you flush them down the toilet and they grow in the sewers to gigantic <laughs> proportions, or they get superpowers from the nuclear waste and they become fighting mutant ninja ferrets. But you know what? There's now that. a rule mm. in my house because my kids got so mad at me that I gave them away. No moss pets. That they you just said they went out the door and never came back. One did, <laughs> but 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 then we had to get others, and then I got tired Why of cleaning all the poop, right. and they smelled right. terrible, and I couldn't right. stand that. So then my children were traumatized because I got rid of them. So now they've been begging for ferrets, and that I owe them <laughs> ferrets, and so finally my husband you owe us ferrets. My husband made a rule <laughs> for each one of them that if they scored 12 goals in a lacrosse cross game that they could get a ferret that's the price of a ferret yes in our house fortunately so it's like collecting tickets for skee ball 12 goals 12 equals goals a ferret? equals a ferret in our family and they're gonna but and you're gonna take care of it. i'm not gonna take care of it whoever oh, right. scored the 12 goals yeah, will have to right or i'll usher right. it i'll open the door so ken ham's building an arc yeah that's an ark park. An ark park. Well, then what is it if it's not a big ark? Oh, it's it's a, a Bible exhibits. So probably well, animatronics. That fun. There'll be animatronic animals. There'll be it's animatronic Adam and Eves. There'll be animatronic. I don't know what. I bet it'll do just fine. I mean, it, it, isn't it a life-size recreation of yeah. the ark? Yeah, 500 yeah. feet long, 80 feet high. Yeah, yeah. it's it, and made out of wood. You know, like I made, made out of. I would kind of like to see that. I've been on yeah. some cruises that felt like it was full of animals. <laughs> I mean. It depends on the cruise, but I'm just saying. <laughs> Can I get back to my news story? Yeah. Go ahead. So Ken Ham is building an ark, and uh, the local humanists and atheists don't like him. Of course, that's not really surprising. So they they uh, decided to take out a billboard campaign against the ark park, um, which he he says. Uh, oh wait a minute. That says genocide and incest park. That's what the atheists have labeled the park. It's the genocide and incest park. Genocide because God killed everyone. Mm -hmm. Incest because then the the That's how they had to Noah family mm -hmm. had to you know. Mm. I think they they have a little bit of a point. <laughs> so well, the, those two the, things did happen. The next line is celebrating two thousand years of myths, mm -hmm. which is wrong on many points because mm -hmm. that wasn't two thousand years ago. Right in anyone's history. Right. That was Jesus was two thousand years ago. Right. And he Maybe that on was the a type er, typo. <laughs> they don't. But they don't know when it. It does. Happen. It does raise a, a, a legitimate point though, and I've wondered this for years. Like when we were having our first child, and you go and you look for nursery furniture or, or blankets or whatever, and you see all this Noah themed, Noah's Ark themed baby furniture, but they never show like thousands of corpses floating around. <laughs> it's like the most horrific story in the whole Bible, mm -hmm. and it's it's. And yet we but make sky, it into this playful, it's a let's zoo. have an amusement park. It's a zoo. It's not a zoo. It's the closest to God's petting zoo that we'll ever get. But that's the same thing we do with everything. Like, think about Samson. I mean, that's a pretty horrible story. Yeah, and but we don't have nursery we make it furniture. We don't decorate our nurseries. With, yeah. No, but we make toys. We have Samson action figures for our kids. Well, there's action. You should be able to poke his eyes out. Poke with eye poking action, <laughs> and you or can you like, can regrow his hair with with yeah. Play-Doh. You can have a big Samson head, and you can put grapes in for his eyes, and then you can poke them out, you can poke out the grape eyes, and then replace them with new grapes. You, so it you, could be a toy for kids eating grapes. You, you know, boys would actually schools. like that. Toy. You really are an entrepreneur, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, let's do it. I grape eyeball Samson toy. And you can cut his hair. Girls can style his hair. <laughs> Boys can gouge out his eyes. See, I'm playing it's a into dual, gender, it's a dual I'm toy. playing into gender stereotypes. Fantastic. And now you can do both at the bathrooms at Target. <laughs> the eye gouging and the hair styling. Okay. Okay. So is, has Ken Ham responded to the atheist billboards? Well, he doesn't like it. But even more importantly, this is interesting. This is interesting, mm, Sky. Can't wait. The two billboard companies in Kentucky have refused to put up the billboards. Oh. oh. Their billboards have been rejected because, hang on. Are there only, like, two, do they run all the billboards in Kentucky? They, uh, yeah, it's two, two brothers. I don't know. But it's the ones that were around there. So they may have to put them up outside Kentucky, they actually said. Um, the billboards were rejected because they were considered offensive and uh, derogatory. So now you've got some free thinkers that are going to say, hey, our free speech, our free speech. But it's, you know. But then they're private business owners. Yeah, private business owners. You can. Mm, We've do seen what that you bit of Yeah. So is this another layer of lawsuit for. I don't know if they're going to sue. It's kind of interesting, though. 
It's kind of interesting that um, that the Ark Park won this one. Although the Ark Park's on a pretty good run legally, they won mm-hmm. the right to hire only Christians. Uh, they won the right to keep their tax incentives mm-hmm. even if they hire only Christians. Mm-hmm. So was they're, somebody they're on a suing tear. them not to do those things? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Who was that entity? Don't Pe- know. People that oppose the Ark Park. Hmm. It's uh, people that oppose the Ark Park POAC. That's a real thing. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I now, thought if it has an acronym, it must be a real thing. now, baby. Okay, that's enough of the news because we have a guest who's getting terribly, terribly bored and wondering why he agreed to do this podcast. Um, Nathan Clark is a filmmaker. Okay, give us your give us your background. When when did you become? When did you make your first film? How old oh, were you? I did. Uh, oh, um, my first film. Well, I, I did sort of institutional corporate communication for a while. That's how I learned everything. But did of. you make a film when you were a kid? No, never did. Really? <laughs> nope. Not everybody's I like did, you. I, it, yeah, it's, it's, not everybody lives the myth, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so l- living the myth. When you were growing up, what did you want to do? Um, I wanted to be uh, a couple things. Um, at Lumberjack? One point I wanted to be a killer whale trainer, but then I realized I didn't like touching fish. So that didn't pan out. Uh-huh. How about uh, ferrets? You touch ferrets? And then I figured I didn't like science, or my b- math did not work with brain. My uh, brain, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> my brain did not work well with math. And uh, what else did I want to be? I'm probably a musician, but I think anybody that is creative at, any, at some point wants to be a musician because you get immediate feedback for your creativity. Um, like I, I've, I've firmly believe that every filmmaker really wants to be a rock star. Um, and probably really every artist wants to be a rock star. So I, um, I did a, a job out of college for a couple of years and then, um, and then found my way into communications. And so kind of learned through that. So what was your first real documentary project then did you do some fun stuff with intervarsity or was it after that yeah the first sort of thing that i felt like i could really imagine what a documentary could be was a project that was a, a joint venture between intervarsity and christianity today and uh it was a project with um andy crouch was the executive producer of it it's called where faith and culture meet and we told six different stories of um Christians in different places that were, uh, I think the phrase that we used was Tim Keller's phrase, that we're trying to be a counterculture for the common good. And that was sort of my first experience in really spending a couple days with somebody and doing a deep dive, as much as a couple days will allow you, a deep dive into their story and really trying to understand what, what made them tick. And it started what I think was a, a really uh, fruitful and enjoyable collaboration with Andy and then ultimately with Christianity Today. Hmm. And how long ago was that? That was uh, in, in the mid-2000s. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah. Which must be where you met Sky. That is, through, that, through the relationship with Christianity Today, yeah. And how did they know that you could do this at that time? Well, Andy had a background in InterVarsity as well. He kind of came up through InterVarsity. He came up through Urbana, and he was looking for a production company that um, could do something that wasn't just uh, sort of news or journalism that maybe had a little bit more of a visual style to it. He had some, seen some of the videos we had done for Urbana, and, and I, I think that sort of opened the door up for that relationship. Okay, cool. Um, so, so how did you did the stuff with Sky, which was what stuff was that? That was this is our city, this right? This is our city, yeah. And yeah, redeeming that was work. Like two or three projects later. Where does one go to see those? Uh, I think you can go to thisisourcity.org. dot org. Is this still? And that'll take you to the website. Yeah. Okay. What is that about? That was a project look, going to six different cities around the country and profiling. Christians who were working for the common good of their city. So we'd interview people. We did a bunch of articles, a bunch of uh, events and speaking. But Nate and his crew filmed some of those stories and made short documentary videos out of them. And they're really inspiring. Some of them are fantastic. Well, any highlight ones or your favorites that we did? You know, the ones that, I, that stick with me the most are actually some of the ones that weren't the most popular. I mean, one of the ones that I just really love was this uh, installation artist in Phoenix, Arizona. 
that did this uh, kind of weekend long installation in a warehouse that was sort of connected to the history of Phoenix, uh, both the history that's to be celebrated and the history that's to be mourned, um, and was very, um, I mean, on one level, if you explain it, it's kind of like esoteric, what he was doing, but he was so winsome about it and and so sort of almost childlike about it. Like at one point he sort of says, you know what I, you know what I think this installation needs? It needs a donkey. And so he goes out into the country uh, outside Phoenix and picks up a donkey. And we've got this great footage driving down the highway in, in Phoenix of this donkey in the back of a pickup truck <laughs> on its way to his art installation. And... Um, but it showed this sort of deep affection for the, for the place that forms you, the place that you live in, and how our responsibility is to, in some way, speak back to that and, and, and to be part of the discussion that forms what our cities are becoming. Okay, so the, the, the film that really caught my eye was the uh, Eugene Peterson you know, Bono piece. How did that yeah. come about? Who, who, who called you? I was I was sitting in an airport in Minot, North Dakota. We had just finished up a shoot. Uh, it was a cold January, and uh, David Taylor, who um, he is a professor. He wasn't at the time that, or maybe he was, but he's a professor at, at Fuller in Texas, and he specializes in sort of art and culture. And uh, he called me up, and we knew each other because we both had a connection to uh, this retreat center in the hill country of Texas called uh, Laity Lodge. And uh, he called me up and said, I've got this crazy idea uh, of trying to get Bono and Eugene Peterson together to talk about the Psalms. And because of their travel schedules, it was just initially he wanted to do an event uh, at Fuller in Pasadena, and it just was going to be impossible. And so that the idea then came to, to film it. And then that morphed into this sort of a little more of a documentary style that documents their relationship. And and um, and so four months later, we were filming it at Eugene's house. And that was a year ago. So we sat on this for about a year before it saw the light of day. I remember I, we were talking, we were on the phone about something last year and you asked what was new. And I had just gone to a U2 concert kind of spur of the moment we got tickets literally the day of the concert i said it's really cool we got to go to the concert and then he drops on me yeah i just i just <laughs> recorded bono with eugene peters i'm like what <laughs> so he totally trumped me on that yeah sorry. how did who who did the creative shaping to go from event to you know where it ended up how much of that were you involved in yeah quite a bit i mean i I'm, I'm not an event videographer it's just not what I'm interested in doing. And so from the moment that David said this is a possibility, I began scheming for how can we sort of tell this more, sort of more immersive story and, and film it in a way that I think captures the gentleness and the affection of their friendship and, um, and just sort of does something more than just... I mean, I, I love watching Charlie Rose, um, but... I thought there was an opportunity to do something different with this kind of piece. And um, so we began just sort of talking through possible ideas. And But that being said, we knew that there were going to be some restrictions to it. We knew mm -hmm. that we weren't going to be able to fly all over the country with Eugene and go to all these different tour stops. We were really, with Bono, only going to have one afternoon and a couple of hours. Um, we knew that we wanted to provide Eugene and Bono some personal time together. They are friends. And, um, and so we were, for part of it, we were not going to film. We were going to turn off the cameras, turn off the microphones, and just allow Eugene and Jan, Jan is Eugene's wife, and Bono to have sort of some personal time. So there were some, it's some, some ways in which sort of the basic structure of the day and what we were given sort of defined the overall aesthetic and form that we created. Right, right. Uh, it, it came out. Quite well. I mean, it's it's visually stunning as well as you know the content is awesome. Uh, so you know, kudos. And if anybody hasn't seen it, it's up on YouTube. Just uh, go on YouTube and look for Bono and Eugene Peterson, and uh, it it comes up. So, who paid for that production? How did how does something like that happen? You know, from a funding perspective. 
Because it's obviously something you say, wow, that's a great idea. That should really happen. Yeah. But then yeah. you say, mm, how do you pay for it? Yeah, David did some fundraising for it, a good amount of fundraising. And um, we called in a lot of favors. Um, and that was basically how we paid for it. Um, okay. It was sort of like a private Kickstarter campaign. We, we knew that we couldn't go public with it. Uh, we probably could have raised a whole lot more money if we did do a, a, a public Kickstarter campaign because I think a lot of people would want to hear this kind of conversation. Yeah. Um, so he did some sort of relatively minimal uh, fundraising to cover travel for us out there, to cover um, a relatively small crew. Uh, it was all filmed with uh, three cameras, a director and an audio, um, an audio man. And, uh, and then we did a follow-up interview with Bono in New York, and then we went back, just one camera cameraman, back to Montana to get some B-roll after we had finished, we had locked the picture, basically. Okay. And then what was the goal for distribution? Like, where, we're going to take this to... Mm, where? Yeah. yeah. That's a good question. I, I think that was... Um, and, the, you know, the business side of my brain says you never do this. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> that was a sort of a latter consideration. I think, I think what motivated us was we wanted to create something that was honest, that sort of captured the authenticity of this relationship, and that maybe spoke a bit into the Psalms. And, um, and, and we sort of trusted that in the, we'll, we would figure out what the distribution would be after that. Uh, it became pretty clear that it would be good for Fuller to use it to launch what they've called a Fuller Studio, which is sort of the publishing, the video publishing part of their of the seminary. Okay. Um, so then that I think defined let, let's get it out to as wide an audience as possible. And so right, it ended up on YouTube. Right. And what is Fuller Studio? What all do they want to do? Want to be careful about speaking for them. Oh, right. um, but I, I, you know. I think there are so many interesting people that come through Fuller, um, people with great ideas and great stories. And I think Fuller Studio is an attempt to sort of capture those in a more artistic kind of way and then reflect it back to a wider population. Okay. Is there any hope that you get to do more things like this? Because that's Yeah, I would, I would love to do it. I would love to do it. Um, you know, the success, I, I, I mean, it, You'd like to think that this is really great because of the work that we did in, in it, because of the purity of the idea or any of those things. But really, it worked because it was Eugene Peterson and Bono. Yeah. And uh, I thought and it I was always, because of the cinematography. I thought yeah, that's right. Really. I always try and remember that in the back of my head. That, like, <laughs> this, this is great because of those two men, not because of us. Um, so, I, I mean, I love the idea. Idea of giving people, you know, it's funny that one of the things that people have responded to, like in many ways, this film breaks all the rules of internet video, right? It's 20 minutes long. Mm -hmm. There's not a clear conflict on the front end of it. It's quiet. It's slow. All these kind of things. But you, one of the most amazing statistics I saw early on about the film as sort of some of the analytics were coming through, and I'm not sure if it's stayed up, but 43% of people that were watching that film watched it through to the end. You're normally lucky wow. if you're 10%. And so I think my hope is that there is a hunger for this kind of more contemplative uh, content. Yeah. And, and, and that, that hunger could be very limited. Uh, in this case, you know, 415,000 people or so have seen it or watched it. Mm -hmm. There's been, I should say there's 415,000 views because I'm sure some of those have been start and stops and, um, so I, to me, that's sort of the hope for this is that, um, maybe it continues to sort of develop and foster, uh, a type of content, uh, with a particular audience that sort of says, we're going to do things maybe a little bit differently. So was there an expectation that there would be a return on the investment or was this just a donation, you know, to this project? for the greater good of good content. Yeah, I think pro uh, my sense is that it would, uh, a helpful framework would be almost sort of a little more academic, that the return on the investment is uh, how it benefits um, 
sort of the greater good. Um, so it wasn't this sort of like, you know, if we, if we give you $5,000, you'll come back with $10,000. It wasn't that kind of investment. But uh, I think a little bit more along the lines of, we think these are ideas, and we think these are men, and we think that this is a relationship that um, a wider audience would benefit from. Right. Do you, <clears throat> I mean, there are a lot of people around the world you know, that have the kind of spiritual matur maturity or gravitas of a Eugene Peterson, and it would be fun to tell their stories, do you have to find a Bono <laughs> to go yeah. along with them, you know, to, to make it work? Is, is, is that the element of celebrity key to exposing people you've never heard of? Yeah, I think that's one of the big, one of sort of the big questions of, I would say, the last five years of the work that I've done. I mean, with the work that we did with This Is Our City, it was very intentionally telling stories of people um, that had this, many of them had the spiritual heft of, of both Bono and, and Eugene Peterson, maybe not quite as much as e mm -hmm. Eugene Peterson, but they didn't have the celebrity. Um, and and uh, trying to find an audience for some of those stories, without a doubt, is really difficult. With this series of films that we've done with Laity Lodge called The Box Canyon, um, it's a similar kind of thing. We feel like, you know, these are great thinkers, great stories, great ideas, great expressions of art. Um, but uh, finding an audience for them can be uh, very difficult. And, and in fact, I think one of the things that came out of the Bono piece was it was interesting to watch sort of the feedback. So the first three or four days, people were like, rah, 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 this is really cool, this is amazing. And then there began to be a pushback about day four or five. And the pushback was from, um, from people like um, Andrew Peterson at, at the Rabbit Room, or from who wrote a really, really great article about the piece in CCM Magazine that I would recommend um, checking out. Yeah, or I read it. From, yeah, yeah, and 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 the article in CCM, I think, it, it sort of reflects um, a little more processing time. But there was a, it was a little right. bit raw at that moment, and it was sort of the rawness came down to, yeah, but doesn't Bono know this artist, or doesn't he know this artist, or what about this artist or that? And I think the thing that's come out of this, especially from Andrew's article in CCM magazine, is. Um, the difficult indictment of all of this question about honesty and art is not towards the Christian artist, but is rather towards the audience. Why is it that the audience is more interested in a cat video than in um, sort of a thoughtful uh, investigation or exploration of contemplative prayer, or wh whatever it might be. Or right. Why is it these amazing songwriters are having a hard time finding an audience? Right, and and uh, we, we we should back up. Though. Yeah, let's back up. What Bono said in in the film that we talked about a few weeks ago mm -hmm. is that he felt Christian songwriters needed to be more honest; that they were not authentic. You know, that they were happy, smiley, fun, fun, fun and not nearly as authentic as the Psalms themselves, which is a valid point. People have pushed back on that, and Andrew Peterson you know, wrote a great piece. In, no in, relation to Eugene, right? No relation to Eugene <laughs> wrote a great piece saying, well, Bono, you're not listening to the right people. You know, you're not going to hear them on Christian radio because that's not what works on Christian radio because it's not what the bulk of the Christian audience wants to hear. But he listed a whole, you know, a whole slew of artists and they, they're out there. And it's fun. I, one of the fun things that, that actually you can do with, with iTunes is start with one kind of obtuse Christian artist, even, even an Andrew Peterson. Type in Andrew Peterson and then see people also liked and you can go on little rabbit holes of getting more and more obscure um, and being introduced to all sorts of really creative music from Christian artists. And, and that's what you know, Andrew Peterson was saying, hey, Bono, dig harder, <laughs> you know, look a little so, deeper because it's out there. And so, but his indictment is what we talked about a couple weeks Bono's ago. Bono's indictment or, or Andrew Peterson's Andrew Peterson oh. is saying that the problem is not that there aren't good, thoughtful, deep Christian artists. It's that there isn't an audience for them right. because that's not what we're buying. Well, that, and I've made the same comment about Christian leaders in general. That the yeah, popular you can ones, make the same comment about culture in general. Right. To say that there aren't good, thoughtful feature films. Well, well yes, there are, but they're not at your local cineplex because like, it's no, no one wants to buy a ticket. There are good, thoughtful, intelligent politicians but we've nominated 
Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah. So somehow the, yeah. the medium that we're using now, the, the, the pervasiveness of digital technology, which gives everyone a microphone and a camera, right. has somehow dumbed down our audience expectations. Right. In other words, does the world just need more editors and directors and filters? Nate, how do we solve this? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it is a difficult, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I, like you said, Sky, I'm not sure that the answer is just creating more stuff. Um, I, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I mean, we've, we've talked about this at, at the church that I go to, is the first step forward that we've made is given a forum to creative people. So what we do is two, three times a semester, basically, uh, we have uh, an event called Makers Series. And we have uh, different makers come in and they talk about uh, the work that they do. And it's given this place for artists to be talk about um, and to reflect on what it means to create and to make and to do so in a context of faith. And... Uh, and I think that's a great, great first step that a lot that we've make, made in that. But then I think the next step is how do you begin to sort of figure out how to bring that into the life of the church so that the artist doesn't just sort of make stuff out there and then come in every once in a while and sort of offer their gift and then go back out there. Um, but how do you bring it into the life of the church? And the single biggest barrier to that happening, I suspicion, is the church itself, the people in the pew um, that are looking for a particular thing from their church experience that doesn't involve messy art that doesn't have all the answers. Right. Hmm. So, okay, so there's like, I don't know how many, at least 10 Christian colleges with film programs now. Yeah. You know, there's one at Regent, there's one at Liberty, there's uh, one at, uh, great one at Biola. Asbury. Uh, Asbury, Calvin, uh, Cornerstone in Grand Rapids. Um, That's just one beep, click for all of them. Yeah, that was a click beep for all of them. <laughs> uh, Huntington is, is teaching stop motion with some old uh, big idea employees that are teaching there. So all of these kids that were raised in the church are taking film courses and then going out in the world are, as a as a filmmaker are you bumping into some of these kids and are you when they ask you for advice <laughs> how do they how do they make something that's meaningful and make a living well yeah that's <laughs> yeah, that's too much to ask but what what kind of advice do you give christian kids that want to want to actually be part of the solution when I was uh, with InterVarsity, um, we would have um, we would have interns regularly coming through, that, and we would have an assortment of interns. We would have those that came from uh, film schools in secular universities, and those that came from uh, film departments in in religious uh, institutions, and then we would have people that were just sort of generally interested in communication. They were maybe really involved in their InterVarsity chapter. And I look back on those, uh, those men and women that were coming through that program, and by and large, I was underwhelmed by the quality of thinker that film programs, whether they were Christian or secular, were creating. And um, th th this is sort of the cynical side of me, that I, I think, like, I was a history major, and, and I, I do want to recognize the temptation is always follow the path that I went on. That's the advice that people want to give a lot. That being said, w when I was a history major, the best historians went uh, to university or to get their PhD, and the best PhD historians end up getting teaching jobs. I would say that that's not the case in film. The best filmmakers go on to make film. They don't go on to teach. Now, there are caveats to that. I think people, you know, you, you work for 10, 20 years and you want to break from it and you end up teaching. Um, or sometimes really great, great teachers are not necessarily great filmmakers. Um, or, I mean, there's all sorts of caveats. But I, I kind of worry with film programs that there's a little bit of like the emperor has no clothes, is not wearing any clothes. And that people are being sold jobs and careers and possibilities that will never be fulfilled. And uh, so anyways, going back to my story of, of 
the interns, by and large, the most interesting people that are doing the, the best work are actually those that were interesting people. They weren't necessarily people that had had like the best film school experience or had had, um, you know, an opportunity to shoot on a red camera or whatever it might be. They were people who were taking seriously their education and were becoming well-rounded, interesting people and developing a point of view that would serve them in their career. And so I think to me, the most important thing, whether you develop it on the job in a sort of apprenticeship type of format, or if you develop it um, in a film school, is getting to the point where you have a point of view and that mm -hmm. you've got something to say, or not even something to say, you've got something to explore. And um, so I, I think that's so you, my you, you think feedback. being a great filmmaker might benefit more from a history degree than a film degree? Uh, in many ways. In, yeah. in many ways, yeah. I mean, I think it taught me how to ask particular questions and to, to investigate things deeper and to look for stories and those kind of things that are Turn sort of core like skills mm -hmm. that one gets in, in, in history. What's your, your dream project? Do you have one? You know, I've thought about, uh, well, I'm trying to decide whether to talk about these uh, <laughs> because, you know, you don't want to say them yet. Right. I okay. mean, I thought a little bit about doing a documentary about CCM. Um, a contemporary you know, Christian it, music. That, that's right. Yeah. That it's sort of, I think it's a fascinating um, sort of proxy for a, a lot of Christian culture. And it's yep. sort of now at its end, it's basically sort of over. And so there's a beginning, middle, and end that you can document. Mm -hmm. I'm just not sure if I'm wired to be um, a kind of archival documentary filmmaker, right. which right. takes you, a very particular you don't, person. You don't feel the Ken Burns <laughs> no. in, in you? <laughs> what does he mean it's at its end? That's a different show. <laughs> uh, but contemporary Christian music has changed radically and fewer people are trying to do it. Well, it's turned into worship music, yeah, yeah, and it's a niche. But but contemporary Christian music, the you know the heyday of Amy Grant and Michael W. Smith is over. Over. Just the the labels are collapsing, and there aren't jobs in it. You don't want to go into it anymore. It's mm. not not really there anymore. Can I ask him one more question? Yes. Um, can you tell me if you learned anything really interesting about Eugene Peterson or Bono that you didn't know before? Mm, that you can also good share. One. That you can share? <laughs> yeah, that I can share. That surprised you? or Okay, well, the thing that surprised me the most and the thing that I will remember most from this experience. So we went up to Eugene's house and Eugene and Jan's house the day before to do setup. And um, the hospitality that Eugene and Jan showed us was unlike anything I've experienced except in a small Lutheran community in the middle of nowhere, Minnesota. I mean, it was just incredible. They immediately opened up uh, their doors and, you know, and, and great hospitality is not just um, giving you things, it's sort of making you feel like you belong in this place. And they have this outrageous ability to do that. And Jan particularly was just absolutely remarkable. And so that will be the thing that I sort of take away the most and will be the thing in many ways that I hope will most influence how I treat people who come into my own home. That's neat. Mm, cool. All right. Uh, final advice for uh, budding Christian filmmakers to just get out there and... Uh, um... I mean, you know, make it happen. <laughs> make, you know, make stuff and, and, and I, I mean, like, I, I find a point of view. Yeah. Um, find a perspective that sort of, that you can go. I, this is the, this is actually, this is better. Um, I am more interested in filmmakers that will explore an experience as opposed to explain. And I think too much Christian film tries to explain. Oh, wow. All right, I have to sum this up with a song now. So hang on, it usually doesn't go very well. It's fun for a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, would you like your film made by Nate? I can tell you it'll turn out pretty great. 
but he's probably got a lot on his plate because he made a film about Bono <laughs> and that helps your uh, your uh, buddy uh, buddy uh, resume resume yeah resume with him Ono Bono Ono your resume get what? it no he's not following it <clears throat> but <laughs> if you want to build a giant arc well then you probably don't want the film directed by Nate Clark because I think that's not really in his ballpark making films about a giant arc park that rhymes with ballpark <laughs> so be honest tell great stories forget about money forget about the glory and you can do good and um, as long as it's not too gory unless the story demands and then just put it on YouTube and see where it lands fold your hands <laughs> and pray for income rain all right. Thanks, Nate. It was nice to meet you. Thanks Thank you, for Nate. being on the show. Thanks, Nate. Thank you. I appreciate it. And go to Patreon. Support us at patreon.com forward slash Phil Vischer, and we will see you next week. Bye, everybody. Bye. The Phil Vischer Podcast is produced by Phil Vischer Enterprises and recorded live at Jellyfish Lab Studios. This episode was edited by Jason Rugg and was fact-checked by absolutely no one. For more information, go to philfisher.com. Hey, hey, hey.